Riley Board of Selectmen uh, meeting for February the 4th, 2013. First on the agenda, I'll call the meeting to order. Remind everybody that this meeting is being audio taped and videotaped. Uh, first on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. And with that, Frank, will you lead us in the pledge tonight? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, One nation under, under God, God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, everybody. Nice to see you. We're very with you. Frank, thank you very much for leading us. <coughs> can, you, can you see that? We don't want that door to be. Okay, good. Because it's open, we were open meeting. Okay, it is about three minutes after seven. It's 7.05 uh, to 7.15. We'll have citizens query in about two minutes. Uh, first on the agenda at 7.15, we have a public he hearing, illuminated sign, special permit for a gateway. And then at uh, 7.30 to 7.45, we will go into executive session just for 15 minutes, and then we'll come back into regular session. 7.45, we have an appointment with Susan Hazen, town clerk. Uh, she's going to discuss the election dates. 8.15, we have an appointment with Senator Tarr and Representative Hill to discuss state budget and local aid and housing authority legislation. So I just wanted to go through that just to remind everybody, just please don't tune out because uh, we have some important items on the agenda tonight. And then we just go into... We just have some uh, regular business, three items in, in general business, and we have one in old business. So, if I keep on talking for another 30 seconds, we can, it'll be 7.05, and, and if I see if I can do that, and we'll be at the <coughs> Citizens' Query. So, we're almost there. It looks like I'm being successful to carry on my speech until 7.05. So, it is now 7.05, and with that, any... Yes, we have a Citizens' Query. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, yes, uh, Lawrence White, uh, 108 Central Street. Thank you, Larry. And uh, I, I've got several questions, but one of the things I want to preface this with is that uh, I'm not as concerned with the, you know, the high-end, low-end coffee makers or the high-end stoves. Uh, this is pertaining to the water department or other expenditures, which really can't be uh, reversed. My concern or major concern is more going forward. Uh, to be ensure, assured that several processes are in place that maybe can uh, st prevent some of these problems. Uh, one of the things that I noticed going to these meetings is that you know whoever came up with the blueprints for the uh, renovation uh, should have been aware that uh, the kitchen, the bathroom, the dryer, outside of the warrant descriptions and although they may not have been fully aware of it they are responsible for these deviations and whoever signed off uh, on the blueprints uh, should also be responsible for the deviations and uh, at the water department meeting of January 29th the water department chairman was <coughs> unaware of the additional 14,000 expenditures for the re renovations <clears throat> that were presented to the selectmen at your January 28th meeting by, by the two water commissioners. So he wasn't aware that his other two members had these expenditures. Uh, the end result <clears throat> basically is that there's uh, over several months period of time uh, there have been multiple deviations from this. Uh, and it's, not, it's basically just not a single incident. And in regards to that, like the supervisor has not been has been advised by his council not to answer any questions. He was here before and didn't answer any questions. Several of the commissioners don't have any knowledge of stuff what's occurred and things like that. You know, it looks like the end result is that <clears throat> no answers will be forthcoming from the water department as far as what's happened in, in the past. Uh, and so my, my questions are, are kind of uh, 
based upon that, you know, money has been spent, is being spent against the uh, water department maintenance account 61-452-5220-100 that is over budget and I know it's on your agenda tonight but it look, I don't know how this could happen and how it continues to happen. Secondly, what procedures are in place and proposed to prevent the non-budgeted, non-warranted purchases from continuing? I understand that there are some <coughs> changes being made in place right now, uh, but it seems like the water department, when they approve these things, should know to which budget purchases or requisitions are being made. I don't see that. And I don't know whether that's happening. And then my third question is uh, with the water treatment plant under construction, you know, $12 million. Uh, I'm just wondering who is overseeing uh, that uh, $12 million uh, program so that none of these past changes uh, or change order requests have similar type of problems. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, again, <clears throat> we will come to um, old business number one on the agenda tonight, which we will address uh, the water department and um, outstanding invoices and unauthorized construction and expenses related to the two new offices. So if you stick around long enough, we can we'll go over that portion of it and we'll kind of clarify some of that, what you brought up tonight. But thank you very much for your for your uh, query tonight. So it is 10 after 7. We'll continue on. We're still in citizen query until 7.15. So um, move on to uh, general business until we have an appointment at 7.15. And go to general business number one. And this is a letter from Mill River Winery uh, regards to street lights. If I can get the paper clip removed here. There we go. This is dated 129.13, greetings. I am writing on behalf of Mill River Winery, located at the intersection of Route 1 and Wethersfield Street in Raleigh. I wish to pr present the idea of installing a street light on poles na number 996 and 999 across Route 1 from our building. I un understand that the Wethersfield Street intersection has had several serious accidents over the years. This is a very dark and unlit stretch of Route 1 and drivers coming and going from our driveway don't don't have much light there. I also feel that in addition to enhancing the exposure of our business and safety of our patrons in passing traffic, these lights will greatly increase uh, driver awareness of the intersection on the path. Thank you for your consideration. I look forward to your reply. Rick Rousseau, Mill River Winery, 498 Newburyport Turnpike, Raleigh, Mass. We'll place this on the agenda for next week and we'll discuss this. Does, how's the board? Any discussion from the board on this? It is a very dangerous intersection. We've mm -hmm. had two deaths at that intersection. We do have the uh, uh, blinking light, uh, the yellow and the uh, mm -hmm. red. I think that has helped quite a bit, but uh, I think that uh, I would like to support having more light at this intersection. Right. I think, I think help. Um, if I remember right correctly, last time I went through the intersection, there is a, um, a large fluorescent, not a fluorescent, I'm looking for the, the proper term, light that lights up the intersection at night, uh, but it's if I remember correctly, there's only one... Uh, but it, you know, it does light the intersection, and you know there is the the blinking li uh, light. Right. But when you come out to Weathersfield Street, I know I have to cross it many times. At <coughs> night. 
<clears throat> and you look left and right. I mean, it's pitch black one way and pitch black the other way if there's yeah. no traffic uh, coming down the road. So uh, I think we probably should go all go out and revisit that intersection at night mm -hmm. and take a good look and then come back and we'll discuss this on the agenda sometime in the future, okay? Very good. In the near future. Right. Near future. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> nights if each one of us can take a ride by there some evening yeah this week <clears throat> yeah and, you know well, the, in the something pool. too the light department will have to get yeah we have to we'd have to like recommend to them to see what they yeah let's take a look at what at the intersection looks like at night yeah and, right and then see take it from um, there take, take it. it from there because exactly. um there is light at the intersection okay because i know I, I cross it all the time now how <clears> much light you know, mm. is required, and um, do, do we need something because of the business that's there? Let's let's take a good mm. look. And the two fatalities that happened were daytime fatalities, and that was before that the that flashing light was in was there. Installed. I mean, you right. come down there, you could. You know, I hate to say it, you probably could you know, not even realize you're in the intersection at before that light was light in there. Was installed. Yeah. The flashing light I, I'm talking about. Okay. Okay, it is about 7.14, and to go forward, don't have time to go into, probably don't, we have a few, few seconds before it is 7.15, okay, it's 7.15 basically now, so, we have 715 and we have an appointment uh, public hearing illuminated sign special permit application for gateway um, illuminated sign special permit gateway we ask uh, for motion to continue the hearing so I'll make that motion open the hearing to open the hearing open the hearing open the hearing I have a motion I'll make that motion I have a motion do I have a second Second. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the hearing is open. <coughs> okay, read the public notice. Uh, legal ad, Town of Raleigh, Raleigh Board of Selectmen, permit illuminated signs. Town, the um, the Raleigh Board of Selectmen shall hold a public hearing Monday, January 14, 2013, at 7.15 p.m. in the Raleigh Town Hall, 139 Main Street, on an application by Joseph uh, Coughlin of Gateway Realty Trust uh, for a permit under Section 8.6 eliminated signs of the Raleigh Protective Zoning Bylaws for an externally lit sign at 141 Newburyport Turnpike, Turnpike, also identified as Parcel 16 on Raleigh Assessor's Map 14 in the retail district. Any person interested or wishing to comment should attend this hearing. Selectmen will accept written comments. Raleigh Board of Selectmen Chairman Robert Snow. Okay, that's a request. Mr. Coughlin is not here tonight, or did he make any? Okay. We'll continue. And, um, we have a Received an unless you your messages. <clears throat> hmm. I mean, he, he sent us the additional information last week in okay. preparation for today's hearing. So I'd like to have him here so we could yes rebut anything or you know make comments. Um. I'll continue on read the memos into the record and hopefully Mr. Coughlin will appear. At the request of the Board of Selectmen, uh, at the last meeting Joseph Coughlin submitted additional documentation for this lighted sign application. This information is attached. See the new information um, has been sent out to the department heads for their review. At this time I would call Mr. Coughlin forward but I will continue with the memos. First memo memo is from 
Frank Johnny, uh, limited lighting uh, bylaw enforcement agent. This was dated um, February 4th, 2013. Special permit application externally illuminated sign Gateway Realty Trust. After review and revi uh, of the revised application submitted by Gateway Realty Trust, I would like to offer the following comments in reference uh, to the compliance with Section 8.6 Outdoor Illumination Standards, including standards for illuminated signs of the Town of Riley, Riley Protective Bylaws. By, uh, one, by the picture of the sign provided in the revised information submitted, it appears that the lighting fixtures will be mounted on the top of the, of the side uh, posts. It is not clear how the fixtures will be mounted or if there will be uh, a fixture on, this, on each side of the sign. If this proposal allows the fixtures to be pointed downward, they would comply with section 8.6.5.4 of the bylaw. Two, after reviewing the manufacturer's data sheet, it appears that the light fixture has a hood extension option. This extension would be uh, needed to fully shield any glare to vehic vehicular traffic on Route 1. If this extension is used and properly shielded, seals the light, it would be in compliance with Section 8.6.5.5 of the bylaw. 3. The illumination level on the surface of the sign per Section 8.6.5.6 depends on the background color of the sign. The <coughs> existing sign has a dark colored uh, background which allows an average illumination level of 50 foot candles or less. The size of the, the sign is not stated in the application. However, according to the sign permit issued by the building inspector, the sign is approximately 32 uh, square feet. It appears that there will be one fixture on each side of the sign. However, it is not stated uh, in the revised information submitted. According to the manufacturer's data sheet, the 150 watt bulb emits 68 lumens per watt <coughs> for a total of 10,200 lumens. A total of 318 candle um, foot candles for one fixture will be produced. This would exceed the uh, maximum limit according to the bylaw. Four, the application states that the sign will be lit from dusk till 10 p.m. The timer on the photo cell would be adjusted to match the closing time of the business to be in compliance with section 8.6.5.2. Please be advised, uh, I'm, I, may be, um, I may be of any further assistance. That's fine. Johnny, okay, light lighting by law enforcement agent. Frank, do you have anything to add to that? Not right now. Okay. Right, I'll continue on with a memo from the building inspector. <clears throat> this was to Amy Lydon in reference to application for illuminated sign, Gateway Realty Trust. Amy, I received your email this AM. My comments are that I cannot tell where the lights are being located on the sign and they appear to exceed the lumens allowed. Ken Ward. Okay. Memo from uh, Police Chief Barker. We have received the application for the illuminated sign permit from Gateway Realty Trust. The Board of Selectmen has sent the public hearing set the public hearing date for this request to January 14, 2013, at 7:15. Can you please come to the Selectmen's office to pick up a copy of the application? There will be a form for for you to sign. Acknowledged to receive this package. Can you? Oh, Mr. Chairman, just oh, I'm, I'm the reading. Page. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm reading the wrong one. That was just okay. an email thread. Okay. okay. <clears throat> From the police chief. Hi, Amy. I have no objection to the sign as proposed. Robert Barker, police chief. Okay. Memo the from. The last sheet is the. Planning. Excuse me. The last page in the packet is the planning, okay. uh, and that's set for you. <clears throat> okay. The planning board. <coughs> Okay. 
to the board of selectmen, uh, Katrina O'Leary, town planner. Okay, this is from the planning board. Sign application for freestanding sign, 141 Newburyport Turnpike, Gateway Realty Trust. At the request of the Board of Selectmen, I have asked to review the additional information supplied by the applicant, Gateway Realty Trust, for a special permit application for an illuminated freestanding sign at 141 Newburyport Turnpike. As the Board's authority on this application is specific in nature, I will uh, limit my comments to the proposed sign's conformance with section 8.6.5.1 sign illuminations and will leave the comment regarding its apparent uh, degree of conformance uh, dimensional or otherwise with section 8.4 signs to the building inspector. From the literature provided, it is not clear if the applicant is proposing to illuminate freestanding sign from the top or the bottom. If the proposal is to illuminate from the bottom, I believe the variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals would be the correct permitting process if he wishes to proceed because it is clear from Section 8.6.5.4 that the luminaries mounting from below the sign are not permitted. However, if the floodlights described in the literature are to be installed above the freestanding sign, they should be properly shielded to prevent glare to the pedestrians and vehicular traffic. Also, the resulting average illumination level on the surf surface of the sign shall not exceed 20 foot candles on the uh, light colored background and 50 foot candles for the dark colored background. <coughs> There's nobody present to, to talk about this. Well, if the board, um, we, like I said, we, don't, we haven't heard anything uh, as to why he's not here this evening, Mr. Chairman. We could continue the hearing and notify him uh, that, uh, you know, of the, of the new date and, and time. Well, I was hoping that maybe he would pop in, you know, during the, this 15-minute. Let's see, he hasn't, hasn't um, motioned to continue the hearing. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we table this or continue the hearing until the applicant is here. I have a motion to continue the hearing. Second. I have a second. Mr. All Chairman, we need a date certain, please, in time. Right. Um, time. What do we have on the agenda? <clears throat> We're pretty open uh, next week. Are we? We have nothing scheduled right now. Nothing scheduled. <clears throat> uh, why don't we schedule for 7.15 then? Hopefully he can come back. Okay, so February 11th. So can I have a, a motion to continue? I have the I have the motion, but it just a yeah. Uh, to um, next <coughs> week at 7:15. Okay. So so move. So move. Yeah, second. second. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <coughs> Frank, thank you for coming in tonight. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we've got about three minutes before we need to go into executive session. So in that time, uh, look for the letter, general business number two. Should have enough time to read this. Letter from the Rally Council on Aging, reference the Smith Fund. Chairman Snow reads the letter, it's a record of the practice uh, that the Board of Selectmen is following concerning the utilization of this trust is that the Council on Aging Board vote to uh, spend funds from the account and notify the Board of Selectmen uh, when it has done so. The Board of Selectmen can take the vote to support the expenditure. January 15, 2013, <coughs> Honorable Board of Selectmen from the Raleigh Council on Aging. The congregate meal 
that Council on the Aging serves on most Mondays comes from the Anna Jake, comes from Anna Jake's hosp, Anna Jake Hospital. The council pays ninety dollars a week for the meal. It serves twenty to thirty folks, and comes in a large container and is broken down and served by the volunteer kitchen staff. Coffee, tea, bread, dessert are provided by the council. The vo voluntary contribution taken in at the meal allows for the food service folks to produce ingredients for desserts as well as tea, coffee, condiments, and paper goods. This meal program was in place when I arrived at the Council on Aging over 10 years ago. It was paid for by the fund donated by the, uh, to the Council on Aging by Clarice Emerson, known as the Emerson Fund. It worked well until the interest rates came crashing down a few years ago. The account is fast depleting. I would like to continue the meals for the seniors as it is the opportunity to have them have a nutritious meal as well as socialization. At the November 2012 Council on Aging board, board meeting, I requested that the Council on Aging use the interest on the Smith Fund to defray the cost uh, for the Monday meal, and it was approved, meeting minutes and closed. The town accepted the Smith Fund for the use by the Council on Aging to benefit the seniors in Raleigh. I feel that the meal program should continue. I believe that the protocol for using the Smith Fund is to notify the selectmen when any transactions are uh, considered. It will cost approximately a little under $500 a year to finance the meal, and this would come from the interest without touching the principal. It would also uh, it would go to the special account created spe specifically um, specifically to pay for the congregate meal. Thank you for consideration, Mary Ellen McGill, Director, Council on Aging, and Mary Bright, Chairman, Council on Aging Board. Any discussion from the board? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we support this expenditure. I have a motion. It's the interest, it oh. does not touch the principal. Okay. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. That's a nice bill that they put out on the yeah. uh, on the Monday for the uh, C COA does a great job. They really do. They, they great people. So, uh, moving on. It is 7:30. Uh, we have a non-union personnel contract negotiation strategy, strategy session. Let me find my... Okay. Deal with that. Call for motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy and preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel and to return to open session. I need one of the members to make a motion. I'll make that motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy and preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel and to return to open session. Okay, and we will return at, at 7.45. I'll second it. And I have a second. And Roll call. All with a roll call vote. Jack Cook. Joe Perry. Hi, Robert Snow. Hi, Stu Delzell. We're, we will be for the next 15 minutes in executive session. And again, we will return at 7.45. Thank you.
much nicer out here. Thank you. <laughs> Joan, can you op open that door? Oh, that's right. I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you. Uh, no, nope. not that far. That's okay. There we go. That's good. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. It is 7:45. We have an appointment with um, our town clerk, Susan Hazen. Discuss discussion of election dates. So with that, Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Turn it over to me. Well, I came to you because um, because the selectmen are the gentlemen who set the dates for the election, set the times for the election, and uh, and I didn't want to make this decision by myself. What we have here is the state has now set um, the date for the state primary is April 30th. And then they realize at the same time, you got to give them credit, that most towns were having elections at right about the same time, right about mm -hmm. that same cycle. So in an effort to help, and I'm not being sarcastic, but I said, <laughs> in an effort to help, they passed legislation that would allow the towns to piggyback their election onto the state primary. And so I got that notification, and other towns called me and said, that sounds great, are we going to do that? And I said, we cannot, because we are legislated by bylaw to have our uh, uh, election on the second Tuesday of the month, uh, second Tuesday of May. Plus, I went and looked at the Triton Agreement, and that says the second Tuesday in May. End of discussion. Um, but Salisbury didn't think that was right. <laughs> this, Salisbury and Newbury are very interested in doing this. Mm -hmm. And so she went to the Secretary of State's um, office by email and, and told them of our plight, that it was actually by lot in for the second Tuesday of May. And uh, the Secretary of State's office said this new legislation would allow us to override that bylaw. Now, state law supersede local Apparently. bylaw. Apparently. However, you know, we're still masters of our own ship. It okay. may, may allow us to do it, but it doesn't force us to do it. All right. It. I spoke to uh, Joe Perry in Newbur Newbury. Story. I'm story. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways, I, t I spoke to Joe this afternoon, and he was interested, because after the discussion, you and I had Susan this afternoon about this. So, um, there's, you know, it, it sounds good, but we, as we were speaking, it throws it some has quirks into it. The same list of it has a list of pros and cons, really does. Um, and I'm not even looking for an answer for you, from you tonight necessarily. I just want to put it on the table that that option is out there. But we do need to decide at some point um, if we went to the April 30th date. One thing our people know, our people being our residents our vote is that it's the second Tuesday of the month that our elections are. It's a long-held uh, tradition. It's a bylaw. I happen to mention it conversationally in a, in a social group, and the people who were with me said, you can't do that. It's by bylaw the second Tuesday. We may be able to override it, but just because you can, should you, um, I don't want people to think we're, quote, pulling something. Right. It would mean the town meeting is after the election. We know our people don't like the town meeting mm -hmm. after the election. Um, it would, I think, it would mean that the town election would run 13 hours. I was usually only run eight hours. It would hard to ever go back to that eight-hour format because they get it in their head that it was a 13-hour event. No, now town election is the seventh. No, it's the 14th. It's. I'm sorry, the 14th of May. Of May. Okay, right. so this would push the election back to the 30th of April. Right. Or forward, okay. Is so. If the, if the election is pulled back to the 30th of April, that means all papers have to be in instead of to run for office on the 22nd, which is a Friday, it would, they would have to be in on the 8th of March. Move and everything forward by two weeks. Everything forward by two weeks. Yeah. Everything. If you were going to put an override question, and I'm not suggesting you are, but if you were going to put a question on the ballot, everything, has everything to be in. would be moved forward Wow! by two weeks. And I think that's difficult. We already have deadlines yes. published out there. Uh, we would certainly do everything we could to get the new deadlines published, to get the new hours published. But you know someone would not get the message. And Yes, and, and budgets and everything else that, you know, going into town, uh, t uh, exactly. town meeting, everything has to be two weeks ahead of schedule. Yep. And I know people don't like the town meeting after the election. I yeah, I know. That's take a lot of flack for that. I don't set either one of those dates, but I take a lot of flack for that. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I'm just saying I want you to be aware that this option does uh, is available to us. I'm not necessarily endorsing it. Uh, another thing is uh, the state, of course, is not going to print our ballots up, so we're still going to print up ballots. It means we would have double check-in, double check-out tables. So instead of two tables on either side, there'll now be four tables. I need eight people instead of four people manning those tables. And right. we have done a double election uh, when Bob Madden passed away, and we piggybacked that onto the state November um, governor's race election. That was doable. That worked. This is a primary. That right. means there wouldn't be two ballots floating around the room, but three. Three ballots. <coughs> That's right. Um, it's an interesting. <laughs> uh, someone asked me, is the state going to pay for the extra election? They did absorb some of the pay for the Kennedy. Uh, That's right. Scott Brown elections, mm -hmm. but they're absolutely mum on the subject right now. They're not making any promises whatsoever, and I don't think, I think the, even the Kennedy election, they didn't decide to pay until after it was all. Everything from Beacon Hill right now is mum. Yeah, when it comes <laughs> I to look. Money. I look at my email twice a day to see if there's more information from the mm -hmm. state. And um, Bruce is coming in, right? Bruce. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But the benefit is, one, it would be easier on the manpower not to have to move all those boots right. down there twice. Just simple muscle power. And two, it would be slightly less expensive for us. We only have one precinct. I think that's why Newbury and Salisbury are more mm -hmm. interested because they have two and three precincts. That they would, um, according to Joe, story. Um, they would save something like three thousand dollars in Newbury on yeah. this, and we could save. I see from fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred. Fifteen hundred, twenty five hundred sa savings. Um, because you know it's still a lot of people. You're still yeah. paying the payroll. We still have to print our own ballots. The only thing we really save on. I only have to have one set of wardens, um, warden, constable, and clerk. Right. I only need that to do that once, so I save on that payroll, and and the automark cartridge. The Automark is the handicap accessible machine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Costs a thousand dollars. Nine hundred and eighty eight dollars to process that to code that up. The state pays for it on state elections. Although they're not legislated to do so. They could stop at any time. So my budget always reflects a thousand dollars for each election. Um, so it would be a money saver if, if if that's the deal breaker. So we um, would really need to get if we do anything, we need next by next meeting probably to take a vote and get this um, taken care of. Uh, I would like to, to I, I have talked, again, I have talked to Newbury, I would like to talk to Salisbury and make sure that they are on board with this also. Have you talked to them? Or just yeah, they called me. They I called you, I think the Salisbury. email ink was dry. Are we going to do this? <laughs> okay. And that's when I said we couldn't. At that point, my opinion was our own bylaw prohibited us from even looking at it any further. Since then, they seem to have made the case to the Secretary of State's office that this legislation will, can override our bylaw. And I have copies of the legislation for each of you, so you can okay. read that over. Um, and so, yes, they are interested. However, I don't think they brought it to their board of selectmen. The clerks are interested. <coughs> um, the Secretary of State's office did feel that all three of us had to be on board. On board, yeah. It may not have to be the second Tuesday of May, but it does all have to be the same day is what they said. So I just lay my case <laughs> at your feet. Okay, I guess we'll take this under advisement and uh, we'll have to think about this for the week and then come and back then, to it. Won't there be another election in June? Yes, it'll be June. one June. So yeah. we're talking three elections three in elections. seven weeks, right. six yep. weeks. Yeah. But, I, you know, yep. we can't do anything about the June. No. I've already canceled my vacation, so we... <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> they never consult me. What can I do? But, what, the the, the June right. election is what, June 30th? June, June uh, 25th. Yeah. 25th. That's the last week in June. Week before the 4th. And it's yeah. because the legend, the law requires that the election be held between 145 and 160 40. days. And so that's the way it, okay. it laid itself out. All right. So that's fine. All right? Yeah, I think it'd be hard enough to for the schools to get their... Uh, Budget mm -hmm. and they're looking. This is going to be. They uh, wanted to postpone it from the 15th of March right. to the I April first. It's more first, complicated so. than it would be easier for yeah. the town clerk. I, no. you know, it has to do no, with. I, I, you're right. The school I want budget. to talk. To, I want to talk to Salisbury and talk to you know, the chairman talk to the up school. there. Yep. And talk to the school also. Right. Um, That's going to yeah, be important. Yes. And I think talk to the constituents if they think we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. Oh, I, you're right. 
Yeah. Um, it's not worth. I, sure. I, I'm not trying to disenfranchise. No. The population. Dave. Well, from past experience, and Sue was referring to it when we had the town meeting switch before, and the conspiracy theories were running rampant. And I think at, at this stage, just to change the election coming up, uh, yeah, I think you're going to put up a. It may sound wonderful and save a couple of dollars, but I think the, the grief that it's going to cause is, is going to be tremendous. Mm -hmm. And with everything else going on, it may not be worth it. With, with the effort to have people looking at you and saying, well, now you guys, you're up to something. We know you're up to something because you wouldn't be doing this. And right. just from experience, and we've all been around the block here, yeah. <laughs> facing those situations. And I just think that, you know, if, you, if you're doing it for next year or something, it would be one thing. But if you're talking about doing it for this, this well, no matter what, everybody's right everybody's going to be up on the grassy knoll, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and, you, and also, and I'm going to bring the other side of the Triton School Committee side, mm -hmm. and I've seen more and more years that the committee has to ask to get an extension because they can't get right. the numbers to you because we're not getting the numbers out of Boston right. in order to, sorry, Brad, right. <laughs> in order to bring the budget to the three towns. Exactly. So, and, and, and in fairness to everybody, everybody wants to have a more accurate figure so that come whatever happens when the budget is finally passed from the state house, that, oh my God, where are we going to come up with this extra money because right. we were cut short? Or we would love to say, oh, it's wonderful, we got this windfall, but I don't think I've heard that too many times. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and I think this really needs to be, you know, talk, talked over. And not just jumped into. And by bringing it to you tonight on yeah. TV, the public will see it too, and they may weigh in on it. I have a saying: just because it can be done, doesn't mean it should be done. And, uh, and, and I again, I want to talk to I want to talk to Salisbury, and I want to talk to Newbury, and really have them think in, in the school, you know, and have them really think this over before we jump into this. It really, again, it really sounds nice to save some money, but you know, it does. The grassy knoll people will be out. Yeah, exactly. It does sound nice, except it could cost us more in the end. Yeah. Um, it, kind of, it could be, and I'm not saying it is, could be Pennywise and Pound Bullish. I don't know. Okay. All right. Can I leave you the, the paperwork? Sure. Mm -hmm. Susan, thank you. You're welcome. And I, I'm sure we will talk more about this. All right. <laughs> Everyone knows I you know, never speak. <laughs> Let me give this to you, Debbie, and I have a copy of the book. Here, all right? Okay. <coughs> Thank you. I gave you too many. Okay. Oh, you Thanks. gave me too many. Thanks. Any discussion from the board about this? I uh, will be attending the uh, Triton uh, communications meeting. I won't be oh, at the uh, Wednesday it. night school committee meeting, but I'll be at the uh, communications meeting okay. on uh, Thursday. And uh, we'll get a flavor from uh, okay. Triton on that. That'll be good. That'll be good, Joe. Anything else, Jack? No. Stu? Okay. All right. If I hear any more through the state um, email, sure. I will add to it. But at this point, they're mum on whether they're going to absorb any cost. And <laughs> it would be, yeah, it would be nice to maybe people up on the hill. True. If they said they were going to pay for the whole thing, maybe it would be more worthwhile. But really only a marginal saving. How much did they come up with last time? With them? You know, I wish I had looked that up before I walked in here, but I know they did come in for only, um, I don't, they wouldn't pay for meals for the workers. I think they just paid for the payroll. Okay. It was a very specific thing that they paid for. But <laughs> something was better than nothing. No one was really complaining about that, but it wasn't a blank yeah. check. Brad, do you remember what, what was paid for on the, the special election last time? It was for um, salaries. Salaries, okay, okay. It was a very specific form we had to fill out. And um, but again, something was better than nothing. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Susan, thank, thank you so you much for you. coming in. I think we're wise to take those. Thank you. We take it under advisement for a week. Yeah, we're going to have to. We need to talk to the other towns. We need to talk to the school and everything else. I mean, it's it's hard enough now. You know, just trying to get the budget together right. and and to um, iron things out. And thank you, Larry. Yeah, to move everything up two weeks is... Yeah. And well, the, does the election actually require you to move up the budget issues? Unless you're going to have an override? The printing of the warrants. The printing of the warrants, everything else would be too much... Uh, well, that's, that's the town meeting. It's not the 
We would have to the have... The election is just uh, a ballot. Right. The right. election is a ballot. If we're having an override, the statute is 35 days before the date... Um, this throws this throws a monkey wrench into approved, anything that any initiative order. like that. Yeah, really, it, it <clears throat> depends on. Or no, I think the override's the only real yeah. effect. If, if any of the three towns are depending on an override issue, that would absolutely. I, in fact, I think you'd probably be almost too late now. Wouldn't you be? <laughs> no, the way it's going. About, I have it on my schedule. If there was. I know. Piece of legislation currently making its way through the legislature that may be of help to this issue. Oh, okay. And you you're going to be talking about. About 10 minutes. I will give you more information on that at another time. Uh, oh. We're working our way through. Oh, good. To try and help ease these issues. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. Because it's going to be right in the middle of a town meeting across the Commonwealth. Oh, okay. Excellent. Okay. So it is uh, 8.05, and let's move on to... Okay. Sign liquor license, uh, general business number three. Is that sign liquor license EZ uh, LLC, EZ Variety. No, 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 no. Uh, the ABCC has approved liquor license application for EZ LLC, EZ Variety. The Board of Selectmen needs to vote uh, to sign sign the li liquor license. Everything is in? Yeah, yes, we got that in today. Um, so we didn't want to wait a week. The ABCC approved it. Uh, the selectmen need to proceed with the finale of voting to sign it. So everything is proper and no problems? Yes, uh, you can see it's been signed off by the mm -hmm. commissioners. Okay. Okay. Do I have a motion from the board? Yes. I'll make that motion that we sign the liquor license. Or easy. easy, yeah, easy, easy LLC, LLC, LLC easy Good variety. Business says easy variety. Okay, second. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Do we need a sign on the right side or the left side? Does it matter? Um, on the bottom. On the left side. Yes. Okay. It's um, going in. Um, it's okay. in it's Joe? Kitchen. Yes, you know where the uh, Mexican restaurant is on Room 1? There's a small business. Um, it's a variety store that's only authorized to sell beer and wine off premise. Where Kathy's Kitchen was. Thanks, Stu. Thank you, Bob. Okay, we are at we are about eight minutes before we go. Uh, we have a uh, eight fifteen appointment with Senator Tar and Representative Hill, who's here, uh, discuss the state state budget, local aid, and housing authority legislation. So while we have some time, I'm going to go to old business number one. Discuss water department outstanding invoices for unauthorized construction expenses related to the two new offices, new kitchen, new bathroom, and new lounge areas, and new gates. <coughs> okay. Um, discuss uh, water department outstanding invoices, unauthorized construction expenses related to the two, two new offices, new kitchen, new bathroom, new lounge area, and new gates. At last week's meeting, the Board of Selectmen took the following vote. Jack Cook made the motion to allow the town administrator to ask town council to proceed if information does not come forward at uh, tomorrow's Board of Water Commissioners meeting. Bob Mary seconded. All in favor was 5 to 0. Aye. The uh, Water Board com uh, Commissioners Tim Toomey and Roy Ricker were going to ask the questions to Scott Martin, to the Board of Selectmen, uh, posed to them during the January 28, 2013 meeting. 
because there was no further information that came from the Board of Water Commissioners meeting, the town administrator will proceed as directed. So we directed the town administrator to go forward to town council. Was there anything forthcoming when you attended the water board <coughs> meeting last last week, Jack and Stu? I direct questions to you, and then also you were there tonight. Well, last week we were there to ask questions, and we could not get answers because uh, of the superintendent out on uh, sick leave, mm -hmm. and I think we got a. Uh, rest with that until we get back they were you know i asked uh, the chairman martin if he knew one different instance that went on and what happened and uh, they kind of directed me to the superintendent which he's out on sick time uh, till further notice and i will myself and Stu was at the meeting tonight at five and they were, <coughs> excuse me, discussed in uh, the uh, gate project mm -hmm. that was thrown around. There was a motion made. It didn't get seconded by Commissioner Toomey to send the gates back, to have them refabricated or whatever by uh, Hardy Auto Body and Weldon. So the question was answered by Mr. Ricker that the, uh, he met with uh, Fred Hardy last Thursday, and Fred's going to make the, the gates good. Mm -hmm. He's coming down and uh, modify him to get him working. Okay. So my question was uh, to him uh, that they uh, spent all, these, all this kind of money in who was going to be involved helping them. So uh, Roy said that they he might need one of the employees to to help him to get it done. So it was thrown around there, but the, we want to get this thing laid to rest. I mean, it, you know, we're creeping up to over $9,000 on that project. Well, it's, I think it's more than that. I think it's 90, well, 90, oh, 92 anyways. Well, it could be over more. We don't know what the cement cost or whatever. <coughs> Excuse me, but Stu, want to add to that? What we uh, the gates? I'm so sick of hearing about the gates, and I'm sure you gentlemen are, the residents are. We have to bring this to a closure, whatever it, whatever it takes. If it takes going to the town council, that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. We do it. However. These gates, in all fairness, the fabricator that built them did not install them. The water department installed them. And at last night, excuse me, at last Tuesday night's meeting, the water department said they bought some concrete doing something out back of the building. Mm -hmm. And at the last minute they said, we'll add one yard and we'll use it for the fence post. So Weight of those gates, one yard, that's a third of a yard for each post, a free post, is not enough for those gates. However, the fabricator said he's coming down and he's put wheels on the gates, like you would on a, a boat trailer, that jack on the front of the wheel. Uh, my personal feeling is, compare it to a flagpole with a large flag when we have a small amount of concrete, the pole will move. There's not enough concrete around the post to hold the gates. Uh, if they made mistakes down there, they certainly have. Is there anything uh, overspending down there? Yes, there is. Is there anything dishonest down there? I don't think so. I just think there's just too many mistakes made down there. Uh, it's all the more reason these departments should be talking to one another to go about it the proper way. 
Okay, I, I think it was brought up, you know, a citizen query tonight. Um, and I think a lot of the citizens in town are very concerned about what's going on at the water department. Uh, it's it's not, and, it, and it's been brought up to me about the coffee maker and the stove, and they were you know, sick and tired of hearing about the coffee maker. So it's not so much the idea of of the coffee maker or the stove, it's the arrogance of purchasing something when it's not on town town warrant. They've gone outside town warrant. The, the people did not, were not given the opportunity to vote on these items. We have close to $50,000 of unappropriated money that came from, came from expense money, the regular operating budget of the water department. And here we have it being used for a capital project that was not even authorized at town meeting. I mean, and I've used this word before when dealing with the water department, but I am appalled. I am just, I cannot believe that we, we are in this position. Again, it's not the coffee maker or anything else. It's the arrogance of going out and purchasing a coffee maker when other town departments don't have the town purchase a coffee maker or a stove or anything for them unless it's been appropriate at town meeting. And it was not appropriated. So, again... I think we should ask council I, I, where I, to go from here. And, and we voted last week, and so this goes, Put again, to, to town administrator, to go to town council and to take everything we have, give it to town council, and proceed forward. And whatever the advice of town council, we'll go from there. Let the chips fall where they may. Right. Okay. Yes. Need a motion to. I know we 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 made that continue. we made that vote last week. So town council <coughs> now has all of this, and will now proceed wherever direction it takes them. Okay. So the, the uh, fabricator was asked to build the gates. And he built the gates. I, I, uh, I have, Stu, I have no problem no, with. I understand. With, you know, people are asked to do things. Okay. Right. And, and again, this is in town council. Let town council take all this information and go sift through it. Sift through it and make a decision, and they'll come back and make a recommendation to us. Okay. So. All right. Let's move on. With that, it's 8.15, and we have an um, <clears throat> appointment with Senator Tarr, Representative Hill. Bruce is on his way, I take it. As historically, um, and I know I'm new to Raleigh, but uh, historically <laughs> what will uh, happen in the other towns is I will begin, and uh, he should uh, mosey on in uh, either halfway or toward the end of my presentation on local aid. Okay. And I, and I know there's a couple other issues you want to talk about uh, as well. Brad, yes, I would, I would like to begin with, uh, again, thank you, Representative Hill, for coming in tonight and coming for the board. And we have a couple of items to talk about. And first, um, the Joan Peterson is here to uh, yes. present for the discussion as we speak. Senator Tarr has just arrived. I would never lie to you. <laughs> Bruce, he wasn't can, can trying to start without me, was he? Was he keeping this open? He was. Yes. Yeah, we have yes. to open yes. that open meeting law thing. <laughs> I wanted to thank Representative Hill and, and uh, Senator Tarr for coming to the Blue and Gold Banquet Saturday evening, taking time out of the Saturday to present to 11 young men crossed over from Weebelows to Boy Scouts. And Brad brought a citation for each one from the, from the house, and Bruce brought a citation for each one of the young men from the Senate. And I want to publicly thank you two gentlemen. They, these young men will cherish those citations for many years to come. That was very nice of you, gentlemen. That was very, very nice. And, and yeah. through you, Mr. Chairman, Stu, thank you for helping to get us there. It was a great night, and it was really encouraging to see those uh, young boys 
moving along in scouting. And really a lot of hope for the future there. Joe was there with me, and yep. I, I said to Joe, imagine where some of these young men will be in another dozen years. Yep, yep. I told it's you, at, you know, in my remarks that uh, many of the Eagle Scouts that we have honored over the past few years have gone on uh, to become uh, very, very uh, good citizens of this commonwealth. And I expect the same from those 11 gentlemen. Exactly. Exactly. Scouting is a very great citizen. Maker. Very proud of the troop and uh, very proud of the Eagle Scouts that have gone on to excel. Well, you're very lucky to have good adult leadership. And that's one of the reasons so many kids move through the program to get to the rank of Eagle Scout is because a lot of the adults in the community care about them and, and help to move the mm -hmm. kids along. And the, I've always said there's a direct relationship between the involvement of caring adults mm -hmm. and Eagle Scouts. And you it's really see true. that locally. You've been very, very lucky. And it was good to see uh, George Pasenka there mm -hmm. on Saturday mm -hmm. night because he's been such an influence in the scouting program. And we get to join with him when he celebrates the, uh, the accomplishment of an Eagle. Uh, but I think we all know there's a lot of work that goes in before that, so it was fantastic. Josh is so humble about what he does. Yeah. And he, you know, he, he'll turn and he'll say, well, it's not me as the kid. But what, it wasn't for Josh, these kids wouldn't be on their way. So It's very true. It, it's life-changing for them. Yeah, yep. Certainly so very lucky. Yeah. It's not from this town, but my grandson is working on his eagle oh, in Franklin. So. Make sure he gets everything done before he's 18, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've had a lot of nail biters with <laughs> getting everything get done. down at the last exactly. minute. Exactly. Yep. Uh, well, first on the um, is uh, Joan Peterson will be present for the discussion on the Housing Authority legislation that Governor Patrick filed, <laughs> which would dissolve the two, uh, 240 municipal housing authorities, 240 municipal housing authorities, and create six regional housing authorities in the state. Joan has a handout prepared that she would like to distribute to Representative Hill and Senator Dutar. Joan, do you want to come up here and join? Instead of being in the background there, no, no, come right along, John. <laughs> <laughs> we all we all. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nice. I had to, I had to be uh, escorted here. That's a, you have a fine <laughs> escort. <laughs> Madam moderator, so that's oh, no, no, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to present this to you, and I know to uh, Representative Hill and to Senator Tarr, They've, they've heard this already, but um, I went in sometime in beginning of January and had a very nice meeting, and I think we enlightened Senator Tarr on some of the stuff that's going on that he was not aware of. And from this original, this has been, been talked about now for almost a, a year, and the governor set up a uh, committee to look at what we can do with these housing authorities to make them function and work better. And we, they, he was originally talking of taking 150 to 200 units or less and putting us into a bigger grouping. Now, this study comes out, and it was the day after I met with you, was completely different than what was in the study. The governor presents six big regions for the whole Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, I don't think it's going to work, okay? But... I'm only one little housing authority, so a small group of us, and we call ourselves the Cape Ann Area Housing Authorities, um, and we're, we're all different sizes. You have Gloucester, which is very big. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how many units they have. You have Manchester, Essex, Wenham. Ipswich runs, uh, she governs over Hamilton because they've just got a few units, so it's Ipswich, Hamilton myself from Raleigh and Rockport, and the only one that's smaller than me is Essex, okay? I have 42 elderly and 12 families. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we sat together for about an hour and a half, and we came up with some of the positive impact, some of the negative impact, and then possible areas of collaboration within the group. Now, one of the things under the negative impact, and I know this is not in the governor's budget, there are 60 existing jobs in these eight housing authorities. And there's no doubt in any of our minds that at least half will have to go on unemployment. They're going to be losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've been told as directors that our maintenance men, ourselves, and our fee accountants, we all hire fee accountants mm -hmm. so much a month to come in and do our books for us, will have to all reapply for a job if this consolidation goes through. Because there's going to be one big commissioner or, or executive director 
and then there's going to be resident service type people. So, you know, right now, if somebody has a problem at my mm -hmm. housing authority, an elderly with the shade or something, you know, I'll say, gee, he's right now working on a plumbing issue, but he'll get to you before the end of the day. If they've got to call into, now, now don't get me wrong, I don't know how it's going to work. There may be somebody on site, okay? But after normal business hours, mm -hmm. like the bigger housing authorities, they have somebody on call. Well, if we're in this big huge, where is this person coming from that's going to go to Raleigh for a furnace out or a backed up toilet? Mm -hmm. You know, something like that. Or if they prioritize when you call in, that shade that Mrs. Jones needs to have fixed that just won't go up and down anymore is not going to be a priority one. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we've got some really good positive areas of collaboration. I mean, one of them, and this is part of Mass Narrows, and this was even before the Massachusetts Association of Housing came out with it, we're looking for regional procurement and modernization. I'm the procurement officer on anything we do. So I have to get the three bids, I have to decide, get make sure the insurance or whatever or whatever we're doing. So I'm the procurement officer. Then we're looking for resident service. I have no services for my elderly right now. But Gloucester has several people, like when they take somebody out of a shelter, they've got this home base program that if the family that came from the shelter is moving into Gloucester wants to work with one of these home base people, they will get them on a budget, uh, get them paying their rents and all their bills. They'll get them right back in the groove of how it is to run a household so that they can maintain it and not be in possible mm -hmm. areas of being evicted. I don't have that opportunity for anybody to come in and do that for me. Um, regional reporting. I can't begin to tell you, I am starting my 20th year, March 1st, the amount of reporting I have to now do. One of the things that I, I says to uh, Senator Tarr is absolutely drives me crazy is I have to report once a month who attended a board meeting cause, and when I had my board meeting. Well, my board meetings, unless I'm wrong, it's changed in the state, it's a matter of public record. Mm -hmm. Who is that? Uh, if they have a question about any <coughs> board meeting that I had, you know, somebody from the Department of Housing, call me up. I'll fax mm -hmm. it over to you. You want to know who was attending to that? Give me a second. I'll look it up and I'll tell you. No, they want to know that now. And the other thing is regional flaw, fraud investigation and collection. Fraud. I mean, you're looking at me and you're saying fraud. Yeah, there is fraud in public housing, whether you like to admit it or not. Unreported income, um, unreported guest staying, or people staying there and sure. not reporting that they're living there. So mm -hmm. now we're, we now have more people living there than we should, plus we're not getting their income. I don't have that kind of time. None of us small directors do. So if you had a regional fraud squad, if that's what you wanted to call it, you know, we're willing to pay our share of whatever it is in order for somebody to come in and say, gee, I think. XYZ's going on, can you investigate this for us? That type of stuff. That's where I think this, he's looking for what, $12 million to do mm -hmm. this? For a startup, yeah. For a startup. Now, that doesn't include if they were to buy me out of my contract, because right. I have a legally binding contract. My maintenance person doesn't. My fee accountant has one till the end, every year. So, I mean, there are several qualms in this whole thing. I don't think they've put in for unemployment to buy people out. And I'm not sure if they, you know, I, I think it looks good on paper, but I don't think it's going to work. Is, is I, I take it there is an assessment to the town for this regional housing well, authority. Well, what they're looking at doing right now is doing away with all our boards and have a nine-member board. Okay. Nine-member board for how many For how one many region. So there's going to be six nine-member boards. Six nine-member boards in in the northeast, is I take it, it's going to be from somewhere Cape Ann all the way. Could be into Lowell, Merrimack, Metal Six, Merrimack, 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 yeah, Merrimack, yeah. and so you really lose that home touch. This is I, I'm 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 not a fan of regionalization. I, I. But another thing is is and I don't know you gentlemen may be able to answer this. I know with my family units, we were not living in the town when they built the elderly units, but it was an just what you were talking about before. The land was given by the town of Raleigh, mm -hmm. and at a vote of town meeting, 
it was to establish a housing authority, mm -hmm. housing authority board, and to build the housing. What happens to that? What happens to that control? Even though they have no control, but my board is four elected residents of Raleigh and one state appointed. Now, we won't have any say in this at all? Uh, from, we from absolutely do. <laughs> well, that's why if you read my handout, okay. our little group, our next action is to, uh, for each of us to go to our municipal leaders, which is our board of selectmen, our senators, and our representatives. Um, you know, people have said to me, you've got to talk to your tenants, you've got to get them to write letters. I don't want to get, I've got 90-year-olds, I don't want to get them up in arms and shaking. And right. the, I want to wait and see where is this going. I want, I would love support that you do not support this. I do know how both of these gentlemen feel about this, and I, I'm going to let them speak because I'm just about done. And then if it comes that we need to get our tenants involved, we will do that. Joan, your job is to take care of our seniors. That's all. That's I'm the senior too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're you're the one to take care of our senior. You, you know, the senior shouldn't have to write a letter and all that. It's our responsibility up here. That's what you know. They pay yeah. us the big bucks. Mm. So. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of regionalization at all. I, it just like I get really uneasy every time everybody anybody in the state wants to, you know. I have a better idea uh, because I, I see that assessment coming and, and you pay out the assessment and what do you get for it? I'm not... Uh, An increased assessment. I can increase and another thing assessment. is most of us small housing authorities receive zero dollars to run our housing authority on an annual basis, okay? The rents that I collect from my tenants at both sites is, enables me to run the housing authority, pay the salaries, and do extra stuff down there that's needed. There is no money from the state, you know, to do these projects. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things is this town has graciously given us, out of the Community Preservation Act, money to yes. remodel those bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have had not one single complaint that the tubs are gone. Because when you age in place, there's a point when you cannot get in and out of a tub anymore. Regionalization is just a return, as far as I'm concerned, to county government. And we got rid of county government, and well, we yeah. did up here in Essex, and I, I don't ever want to see county government return because, again, it's just an assessment. Here's the bill, you know, put it in the envelope and get the money to us ASAP, and that's, you know, you have very little in touch with the county, okay? Or the, mm -hmm. I feel the same way with the, um, you know, people. The seniors would be on the phone calling a regional district trying to get somebody dispatched to fix a toilet, and it's not going to yeah. get done. Until and I will tell you, uh, David Holden, who runs Gloucester Housing, um, he was, I think, an assistant director in Haverhill. Then he went to Newburyport, and that's when I met him several years ago. Maybe Salisbury and then Newburyport, and now he's running Gloucester, and he is just an outstanding executive director. He's got 30 people working under him. I think where you live in Gloucester, I think you hear positive feedback about him. If I had to get into a region of a group of mm. house, this is the group I want to be in. It ain't broke. Why well, fix it? And I don't see, I think we our housing authority is in good shape. Uh, the board want to add to? Well, we're going to hear from. Oh, well, I just wanted to okay. just as yep. what Joan said. And then I'm going to turn it over. We have a, I think we have uh, we support the uh, Joan in uh, the uh, Raleigh Housing Authority. So we're going along well, fine. Well, who who would like to go first? <laughs> I'll, I'll start <laughs> and, and by saying that we have, we have met with Joan as well as all of our uh, directors. Um, we had a nice breakfast a few months ago um, when we heard that this was all going to be happening. And we heard the concerns from all our local housing authorities. I, for one, I'll speak for me, uh, will not be supporting the governor's initiative when it comes before us. And from what I'm hearing, and I'll speak on behalf of some of the House members, is they're not too keen on seeing this move forward either. Um, this seems to be something that was put forth because some of the abuse that you read about in the uh, local media, mm -hmm. uh, Chelsea and, and things of that sort, and he felt as though that he needed to step up to the plate and do something to try and address that, and this is what he's proposed. Um, Joan has mentioned to you this group of Mass Narrow, mm -hmm. and this is the group that advocates on behalf of all the housing authorities across the Commonwealth and they've actually come up with a plan on their themselves that I think is even a better plan 
and it looks at looking, for example, uh, I know for, and I'll speak to Ipswich for now, is the Ipswich Housing Authority was having an issue with trying to renovate mm -hmm. the um, residences that became open, and in fact, they probably, I think they had close to 30 at one time, Speaking if I'm not units. mistaken. Yes. Yeah. And what Mass Narrow would be proposing in an instant like that is a smaller uh, housing authority would be able to contract with a bigger uh, housing authority of their choice who would then come and help uh, get those units available as soon as possible. Right now, really, we don't have anything in place that would allow that to happen. So Mass Narrow has come up with about five or six pretty good ideas that I think would be uh, worth uh, entertaining in the house. And I think that probably would be the route that we would take. Uh, from what I'm hearing, and I think Senator Tarr is hearing the same thing, uh, there's not too many people too keen on this plan. I do know the, the governor's pushing it very, mm, very, very hard. Um, because he does believe it's going to save money and things of that sort. What we don't want to see, and Bruce and I have talked about this, we don't want to see the local con control be taken away. I can attest to the fact when there's an issue at any housing authority that isn't addressed pretty quickly, we get the phone calls as well. Mm -hmm. And then Joan gets a phone call. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's a better way of ensuring that the residents are taken care of. Right. So from my point of view, I don't think that this is moving at a very quick rate uh, through the legislative process. And from what I'm hearing from my North Shore colleagues and Merrimack Valley colleagues, they're not too keen on it either. And that's including the urban legislators. You know, Mr. Chairman, sometimes when we talk about things that are wrong, we omit talking about things that are right. And I would say for the record uh, that you've had a wonderful housing authority director here and my office has had the pleasure of working with her over a number of years and we do get a lot of calls from folks not only folks that are in Rowley who need housing but maybe folks in other communities that would like to come to Rowley and Joan is always responsive always as accommodating as she can be within the rules and within what's practical and in fact you might have seen me hand her an envelope tonight that's actually about a case we're working on so the, the fact that that she's always there to answer the phone She's always there to get the maintenance done, always there to accommodate people in the best way that they can, and she's always there to enforce the rules because she has a very difficult role in some cases with mm -hmm. folks that may not be playing by the rules, and it's not fair to the other folks in public housing if they're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So what's right is that she's doing a great job, and we enjoy working with her. I know Brad's going to enjoy working with her as well as we do with our other housing authority directors. So I think we need to say that. That being said, over the last few years, we have identified problems in the system. And the most notable examples of those problems have been some very high-profile housing authority directors mm -hmm. who have been less than honest with their accountability. And there's no doubt that we can't tolerate that. But the question that has to be asked is, why didn't the administration deal with those folks to begin with? And now we have this sweeping overhaul of the system. All of that being said, I think these, first of all, you do have a role and we all have a role. As Brad pointed out, the governor has filed a bill. It's like other bills. It's there for our consideration in the democratic process. And your advocacy or opposition, as the case may be, is important in that process. We take that very seriously and our colleagues take that very seriously. There are some things here that could be done that make a lot of sense. But you have to ask yourself, is the largest part of the governor's proposal about control or about efficiency? And I would suggest to you that it's about control. And I would prefer to have these local resources under local control where someone is accountable and responsive and gets the job done for these residents who depend on this. This is a critical need. And I take issue with the notion that some folks suggest that the way to have better accountability is to have a larger bureaucracy. And the reason I take issue with that is because Brad and I have been working on other issues where the larger bureaucracies have failed. One of them is the state drug lab, where we saw a large bureaucracy <coughs> imperil the criminal justice system because of what happened there. Mm -hmm. Another one is the oversight of compounding pharmacies in Massachusetts, where again, a centralized mm -hmm. bureaucracy failed. And as a result of that failure, people have lost their lives. 
So I don't agree with the proposition that just because you centralize something and make a bigger bureaucracy, it's going to be more accountable. But putting that aside, NARO and the, and the directors, and many of us in the legislature, there was a commission that looked at this, I was fortunate to be a member of that, have identified some things that frankly we probably should have done for a while. And I think the governor's bill is an impetus for us to do some of those things. So Mass Narrow, as Brad had pointed out, and Joan talked about, put together its own bill. Mm -hmm. And I am actually co-sponsor of that bill. Now, I still think there are more things we can do, but let's talk about what's in that bill as an alternative. One of them is to have a centralized list for applicants. Because the current system has been that people go from town to town and fill out different applications when really we ought to have a centralized list and see who fits with what community so that someone who is homeless or in jeopardy of being homeless has a much more efficient system. Mass Narrow supports that. Another idea is trying to make sure that housing authorities are accredited just the way that we accredit other institutions like our schools to make sure that they're at a certain level and if they aren't we can help them. Third issue is one that, that uh, both of the prior speakers have talked about and that is trying to find economies of scale where we can. So if there's a way we can buy things in bulk procurement and get a better price by having a group of housing authorities do it, why not? Mm -hmm. Same thing is true of capital improvements. And Brad made reference to the, the very successful endeavor we had with Ipswich and partnering with housing authorities for a specific project to get a job done can make a lot of sense. The other thing that makes sense is to have some audits because there's no doubt that there, in any system there will be folks that try to break the rules. And having audits make sure that everyone is, is on notice and kept accountable. Mm -hmm. Those are all things that are in the Mass Narrow Bill, which is why I support it and I think Representative Hill looks upon it favorably as well. But I guess the advice I would give to you about the legislative process is in the end, we probably won't wind up voting on either the Narrow Bill or the governor's bill, it'll be something that reflects some of the elements of both. But as far as I'm concerned, when I pick up the phone, I want to talk to Joan Peterson. I don't want to talk to somebody in a centralized bureaucracy who might not be responsive. And, and what will wind up happening, my prediction would be, if we use that system, is that Brad and I would wind up on the phone talking to the bureaucracy to get things done the way that we do on your behalf oftentimes, whether it be with the DOR or the DEP or whatever, rather than someone locally being able to call the housing director and get a response. You're going to require more raids. Well, that's <laughs> I mean, I mean they, the bureaucracy will just, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. You Chairman. instead of. It, but there are a lot of positive things that we can do mm -hmm. and we should do. And some of those ideas have been germinating for a while. It's just that now we have the impetus to do it, and I think we will. And I would encourage the board to support some of those things, and we can share with you the narrow proposal we have it in your and some, some positive things that, that we ought to move forward with, no doubt about it. And, and I think it would be actually a missed opportunity if we didn't do some of those things. But it would be a mistake to create this large bureaucracy of you know, six housing authorities, which, by the way, would be the members of which would be appointed by the governor. Mm -hmm. Um, from recommendations perhaps made locally, uh, but the appointees would be by the governor. And that, uh, it, again, it's a, to me, it's an unacceptable power shift into the city. Right. And, and how right. are those people, you know, those, those appointees, they're not going to know the issues of the local cities and towns. You know, we have 351 cities and towns. You know, they can address their problems. We don't need a bureaucracy put in here. That's just going to muddy the works. And you know, Joan, you do a great job. I want, you know, you really do. And everybody in town I talk to that has come in contact with you, they always say, you get right to the problem, and you, you know, you address it, and it's done. And so. It's enforcing the rules. A lot of times, I when somebody comes into me for something, I say to them, you have to understand, I don't make them. I have to enforce them. Right. You know, somebody above me, higher up, in Boston has made these rules and, you know. Well, if I was going to have somebody enforce the rules, Joan Peterson is the person <laughs> I want to have enforce the rules. <coughs> but um, it seems. You, and you make a great me. moderator at town meeting. <laughs> well, you rules just keep buttering me up, right? <laughs> I haven't <laughs> taken my papers out yet. So you just <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like the bill, the uh, governor's bill, 
is uh, I'm a former teacher, and if you have one or two students in a classroom getting out of hand, and you don't take it out on the whole class. Mm -hmm. And if you have uh, the, uh, directors of certain housing authorities, deal with them. But you don't have to, you know, we have a, uh, Jones doing an excellent job here and we want it to, co uh, to continue. And we want the others in the uh, KPN area and throughout the state. They're doing a good job of them Matt, continue. Uh, housing had a, a, some sort of a, a grading system and I've always gotten right up there on the top of it. I've taken my public housing management from the federal government, not from the state. Um, I've I think four audits or five audits never had a finding on anything so I mean mm -hmm. the smaller housing authorities because we're so small we have to run very efficient right okay mm -hmm. and and not in in saying anything about the bigger ones but you know it does get away from you you know you're sitting this executive director sitting in this office and you've got regional areas or how people in charge of buildings and everything else you you can't watch the day-to-day -day operations all the time you know it's a two-man operation here you know sometimes the maintenance man and myself we play good cop bad cop you know somebody's going to come in and say this okay well where are we going with this you know you have to i mean and he's only part-time he's 32 hours a week I'm, I'm, I had a picture in my mind i wonder who was good cop who was bad cop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I will just add, I've been on the board with Joan for 18 years. Oh, my God. Really? <laughs> with being a member of the House and Authority. No question what she does and looks into matters quickly. Someone calls that morning. She does address mm -hmm. the issue by the day or whatever. And her and Tony... And you only get, what is it, Joan? I'm 16 hours a week, but and I'm there 20 many, to 24. Yeah, that's going to say 24 hours. So, I mean, we're getting our money's worth from that. Absolutely. Believe yeah. me. Absolutely. If these housing yeah. authorities ever regionalized, it would be the good directors, like Joan, would be getting penalized right. for a couple of bad apples. You know? Exactly. Right. Exactly. What One do you of the first things I, sure. I uh, learned when I was first elected for a Raleigh uh, representation is when Joan asks you to do something, you do it. <laughs> so, um, you can be assured on the House side of things that uh, we've heard you loud and clear mm. and we understand the issues and we're going to be working with Mass Narrow as well as all of our housing authorities, um, directors here in the area to try and, and get this done right. And I think we will. It, it, it could be fear, it could be respect, but either way, it's a motivator. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be we're going to be handing out a uh, oh, packet geez. for you, and within that packet is the Mass Narrow uh, recommendations. So uh, when you're writing your letters for testimony for or against the bills okay. that will come forward, I think this will be very helpful for yeah, you. Yeah, and just a, okay. a word on that: the the bills just got filed last week, mm -hmm. uh, the week before rather, and co-sponsorship season ended last Friday. So everything's getting referred to committee. Obviously this will probably go to the Committee on Housing, but we'll let you know okay. when the bills are referred so you're not just sending something into the abyss. You know, we'll let you know the committee chairs and, and their information so you can write to the right people on the bills. Your Excellent. feeling your Excellent. feeling on the on the hill, both of you. What is your gut feeling that you've been on this the, issue. On this issue, do you do you do you get get a sense that as I mentioned, the other representatives and the senators, they're not really keen on this, or they're it's, not, it's a not mix, as mixed bag as right the, now. Uh, as the governor would like, okay, and it, that's not down uh, party lines. Uh, many of our Democratic colleagues have publicly said that they are not interested in the proposal as written. Okay, uh, it, and again, we have a lot of respect for our housing authorities, but we also have a lot of respect for Mass Narrow. Mm -hmm. And when yes. they come in and they speak to us, you know, we listen loud and clear. Okay, um, and I, again, I can only speak for North Shore and Merrimack Valley legislators. Uh, they're not too keen on it. In fact, correct me if I'm wrong, not one person stood up and support the governors when we had the breakfast. I believe everybody that stood up was against I don't, it. I don't believe any legislator did. I think it's also significant to recognize that the lead sponsor of the narrow bill, the alternative to the governor's bill, is Senator Mark Pacheco, uh, who is a Democrat and not a shy one. Uh, so I don't think it's a partisan issue at all. I, I okay. think that this is more of an issue of one philosophy versus the other with regard to public housing. So my, my sense, Mr. Chairman, to give you uh, and, and through you to the members an, an honest assessment of as we stand here today, I think you're going to see some change. 
I don't think you're going to see the governor's plan to change the control to have these large housing bureaucracies. Mm -hmm. But I think you will see some other things, and frankly, I think you should see some other mm -hmm. things. So I think things are going to change, and that's why we would want you to be in a dialogue with us as this moves forward, because it's impossible to predict everything right now, but I think a lot of what you see in the narrow bill will wind up on the governor's desk, okay. and a lot of it should. <coughs> would you like a, um, something from our board? Yes. At, at some point. Uh, yeah, yes. I, I guess what we would say is, is to wait. We'd ask you to wait okay. until the bill gets referred to committee, okay. and that committee will have both bills in front of it, and that would be the appropriate time. But again, one of the other things that's just happening is committee chairs are being appointed and members of committees are being appointed. So right now, it's just a little bit premature, okay. uh, but in the very near future, when everything settles, the bills get referred to committee, we know who's on the committees, mm -hmm. then we would ask you for an expression uh, on this issue, and, and it would be most welcome. Okay. I think I think you hear the, how the board feels right, right now. and uh, we'll, we'll actually um, be in contact with you, and we'll uh, get you the information. We'll help you write the letter if you need and, and all of that. <coughs> Right. Okay. Again, I'm not a fan of regionalization at, at all. I just see this a, a boondoggle, you know, a nightmare. So. Thank you, Bill. Okay. You're welcome. welcome. Thank you. John, anything else we can do for you? No. No. Okay. No. When do the papers do? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. <laughs> Um, next on the agenda, uh, we have the senator and our state rep here, is the state budget and local aid. So, with that, I will turn it over. You can flip a coin or okay. however you want to do this. <laughs> this. This, Mr. Chairman, just so you know, because you haven't experienced before, is Representative Hill's famous packet. Yes. It is a compendium of details relative to the budget. And it is, is not only in a single issue, one volume per year, but with many issues. So That's right. This is the first of, uh, of the year. So. Well, uh, Senator Tyre and I, we, we try and go to all our boards of selectmen and our school committees, which we've been doing for the last couple of weeks since the governor has proposed his budget. And we've been waving a red flag uh, for a few reasons, and we'll get into those in just a minute. Uh, but more importantly, in your packet, I've given you the cherry sheets for the town of Rowley and for Triton. And as we, we look to Rowley, we'll notice that when the governor proposes local aid numbers, what he really uh, tried to do is increase the education side of local aid. The unrestricted general government aid remained uh, stable and pretty much level funded from last year. I'm going to be looking back and forth here. Um, and you'll see that under general government, the 456,773. What you'll see in the next uh, line item is a new line item that the governor has proposed in his budget, where he takes a few million dollars, puts, puts it aside into a new account, and puts it into a new formula that he hopes that uh, will get out to cities and towns. For those of you uh, who may remember, we used to actually have an additional assistance <coughs> line item, yeah, if you yeah, remember, yeah, and none of us in the legislature could actually tell you how that money was ever distributed and how much monies uh, you would be getting in that. It was very odd the way, yes. well, this is very similar to the additional assistance okay. that we actually merged into the unrestricted mm -hmm. government uh, a few years mm -hmm. back. And what again, what I'm concerned about is a lot of that new funding under the formula that he has set up is basically going to help more of the cities than it is suburban communities. They would be getting millions of dollars in additional funds, whereas you get $20,000. To us, uh, and I shouldn't say us because I don't want to speak for Bruce, but what we've talked about, that's unfair. We have been trying to get away from those type of formulas. Uh, we think a more fair formula should be put into place, which is very much like the lottery formula, which tends to be mm -hmm. a lot fairer um, in distribution. This absolutely, in my opinion, sides with the big cities, and they would get the bulk of those additional dollars. I don't think, from what I'm hearing, that the new account will be adopted in the House budget, uh, because again, it's very, very unfair to suburban communities 
uh, like Rowley, like Ipswich, mm -hmm. and, and so on. So for town dollars, level funded yeah. is what okay. we're, we're saying right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'll see an increase in the unrestricted government aid mm -hmm. uh, throughout the whole process. The debate is absolutely going to be in education and Chapter 70. Here, level funded throughout the whole entire budget is my sense. However, we get into the Triton side of things, and we again are raising a red flag because <coughs> in the proposal by the governor, uh, we would see an additional $70,000 going into the coffers at Triton. What we're concerned about is the regional school transportation takes a hit. Now, to be fair, a lot of times uh, you need to understand with the regional school transportation, this is a reimbursement program. So a lot of times you'll see a big cut like 104000 That's because the state doesn't know what the reimbursement for that district would be because it's a year away. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen historically and what we've seen in the budget that's being proposed is that it's actually level funded, give or take a few thousand dollars from last year. So I would probably estimate that once again, that is going to be level funded from last year to this year's figure. What we're concerned about is the Chapter 70 allocation. The governor has proposed, and I've given you um, some information on it, I've given you a State House News Service uh, news report. I've also given you a Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation report, mm -hmm. and I've also given you an executive summary. In order for these additional education dollars to be realized, we would have to adopt a lot of taxes being increased. He builds his whole budget on taking $400 million out of our rainy day fund. We estimate that as is, we would see an increase in revenue to the tune of about $800 million. And then he asks for $871 million in tax increases. He's looking to take the sales tax and lower it, and at the same time increasing the income tax. What we're concerned about is what used to be a very stable tax, the income tax, for the past three or four years has been very, very unstable. We're also concerned that the sales tax, as of today, actually has five cents of that 6.25 dedicated to certain accounts, one of them being the MBTA, uh, which is something that, again, he's trying to create a new revenue stream by increasing the taxes to help pay for the infrastructure and the MBTA. One of the reasons the MBTA actually is down a hundred million and in this case two hundred million over the last two years mm -hmm. is the sales tax revenue was never realized they had estimated a certain amount and they never hit that amount it kept coming in under what they had anticipated our fear is with the income tax the same things going to happen he believes that he's going to be collecting a certain amount of money and very much like capital gains it's been a yo-yo for the last three years and that's something that's concerned to us. So what we're recommending to our school committees, and we've been in, you know, on the front page of the Ipswich Chronicle recently, uh, we were in the Hamilton Wenham Patch uh, recently, all of our school committees in the other areas are level funding their uh, estimates <clears throat> as they build their budget. Now, I heard you talk about the fact that we don't give you the monies very early, meaning an, uh, mm -hmm. a cherry sheet as early as your town meeting. That's something we've been very concerned about over the past few years. We actually have tried to pass early local aid resolutions and we have been defeated on most years. Uh, Senator Tarr tried to add this language to the rules. We tried to add it to the rules that you would get it by May, uh, excuse me, March 25th and unfortunately uh, down party lines that was defeated. We hear what you're saying about your budgets we feel very strongly you need to get those local aid numbers as soon as possible. Sadly, I can't promise you that you would get them before the last week of April. Um, the budget will be presented out of the House in mid-April, and then we have a week to offer amendments, and then the last week of April is when we uh, will be debating the budget. It is at that time that I would be confident to come back to you and say, 
This is the floor of local aid. Mm -hmm. Historically, the governor's numbers are the floor. I would argue to you at this point it's probably the ceiling and it's probably going to be coming down, which is something in my time in the legislature has not happened before. But um, as I said to you, I've, I've given you the MTF report and it shows how many taxes he is looking to either increase or withhold from us, uh, which is 44 would be the total of withholding taxes that he would be taking away from uh, the middle class citizens of the Commonwealth. Uh, again, very, very concerning. And the fact that he's taking over $400 million out of the rainy day fund, which would bring it down to a billion dollars, and it was around two. Um, the last couple of years. So the Rainy Day Fund? That's our our stabilization fund for Stabilization. The state. So it was up around $2 billion. It was at 2.3 was the highest, I believe, yeah, uh, give 2. or take. Yeah, 2.3, so now we'll be down to about a... After, if this was to be adopted as he has hoped, it would bring it down to a billion dollars. Because okay. we've actually had to take some funding out of the st uh, stabilization fund this fiscal year. Uh, to pay for some items that I, I think a message to bring back from from us as I go around town I you know I'd like to talk and I talk to a lot of people in town one of the things since I've heard about this you know going into the the Meyer meeting and I heard the governor talk about uh, state income tax raising up to 6.3 and lowering the sales tax down to four point four and a half four and a half. Yeah. My constituents I hear around town says they're ready to move out of the state. I mean, you have the same thing in California where they just raised the income tax to 13.3 percent. You know, and it, this boggles my mind. I mean, who wants who would wants to live in a state with high a high income tax when they go down to Texas or Florida, and they say, and they come on down, we'll walk in with op open arms. <coughs> Um, well, just think of just think of a football player. Where do you want to be drafted to? Do you want to play for the Patriots, or do you want to play for the 49ers, or do you want to go play for the Houston? You know, Houston. This ba baffles my mind to put this burden, especially in the you know. I look at the macro um, economic situation, and we've been hit, all of us, with um, higher Social Security tax. Um, everybody right off the bat would have been hit with about, about $1,700 worth of taxes if you make $120,000 a year, which you have two people making 60. That's you know usually in a, in a community like this. And that, they, they, $1,700 taken out of their pocket right away. Now the governor comes back and he's proposing, you know, ta I'm, I'm going to get my soapbox here and, <laughs> and, and, and go. But I, am, I, 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 I go around town and I hear this and they have People are frustrated. Well, I'll tell you, their frustration is going to be at a fever peak very, very soon if these uh, initiatives were to be uh, adopted. Let me give you some examples because I really don't think people understand what's being proposed. Uh, the exemption of capital gains on home, home sale. Homeowners would no longer be permitted to exclude up to $500,000 of gain from the sale of a primary residence. Child and family related exemptions. Deductions for dependent under 12. Residents with dependents under age 12 would no longer be permitted to deduct the $3,600. Taxpayers would not be permitted to deduct the cost of employment-related child care from their personal income. Um, we have a, a chance where we can withhold some uh, when we have to pay a college tuition. That would be removed under this proposal. And people need to understand, when I talk about the $800 million that he hopes to generate for FY13, that's for six months of this year. That's only six months. Starting January 1st, it would be double that amount that would be coming out of our pockets because you're only collecting six months. So the reason that we're coming around and talking to you is we don't want you, at least in the education side, to be putting down the number that he has proposed. But we feel the only way you're going to get to that number is by us adopting all of the taxes that he wants. We will argue to you that with the increase of $870 million that's being projected in revenue, that that should be enough to help out with education funding and increase it. The special education circuit breaker, something that we worked very hard to get uh, implemented, um, we see that he actually does level fund that as well, and we're hoping to put some more dollars into that. 
Um, you know about his, his uh, plan for infrastructure. That is all part of this proposal. Um, Bruce will, and I'm not going to, I'll let Bruce talk to this issue because uh, I know it's near and dear to him, but the fact is he's trying to increase our rail service by adding new lines. And I don't know if you've gotten the calls, Bruce and I have over the last week during these cold snaps, mm -hmm. the people from Newburyport to Raleigh to Ipswich have been stranded for an hour on the platform. And when they call looking for help, they're not getting any answers except to say it was cold last night, so we're having some issues. Well, we all knew it was going to be cold. Why didn't you uh, get ready for that problem? And we're seeing this over and over, that we have a very antiquated rail system. And yet, he's asking us for hundreds of millions of dollars to not only put into the infrastructure, but to add to it. it. We would argue to you that we need uh, some efficiencies to happen before we can even entertain giving you that type of money. The, the, we just talked about the housing authorities. The infrastructure, the MBTA, is a broken system. Why on earth would we continue to putting money into a broken system without first looking at reforms to the MBTA? One thing that drives me absolutely bananas, I was quoted as saying this the other day on the news, is the fact that I took the train the other day and because of a very big rush in one particular station, by the time we got to the next station, the conductors weren't even taking the money from the people who got on. So we're not even retaining the fares that we should be. Things like that are driving us crazy. But now I'm getting on my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I didn't mean to do that. It's contagious. Um, so we just give you a little synopsis what he's really proposing for taxes. We're raising the red flag on the local aid right now. Okay. Uh, we're going to be meeting with Triton, I believe, very soon to give you know the same uh, talk that we're giving to you right now. And with that, that's where we are local aid-wise and state budget-wise from the House side. And again, very similar to the Housing Authority, a lot of what's being proposed by the governor is not being looked upon very fondly from either side. Um, because we believe we're not out of this bad economy yet. We think what he's proposing is going to hurt uh, the middle class for sure. Uh, and those people who are struggling to make ends meet on a check-to-check you know, -check basis, uh, this, this would kill them. And the fact of the matter is we continue to lose residents out of Massachusetts. And I think doing something like this is just going to force our businesses. For example, he goes after registration fee increases mm -hmm. on our vehicles. And we talked to, as a matter of fact, A. Rowley, landscaper who owns numerous uh, vehicles, this would kill him. He goes, look outside. We've had two minor snowstorms. I have all these, this fleet of trucks. If I have to go and double the registration fee, <coughs> it's going to kill us. And it would kill them. So yeah. that's, um, you want to give a Senate side? Well, I, I, and I don't want to retread ground, but I do want to put things in perspective just a little bit. And it's important to understand that under the current, in the current fiscal year, we were not meeting our revenue projections. And as a result of that, we have a $540 million gap that the governor put a proposal on the table to close. Now, one of the things that's interesting about that is he actually asked to help close that gap by reducing local aid. But in order to do that, he would need legislative authorization because it's not within his so-called 9C powers. And we have refused to give him that power, and we will continue to refuse to give him that power. But that doesn't mean that you haven't been affected. One thing that's always been near to this board and that I've worked with you on and I know Brad will work with us on has been the issue of regional school transportation. And the governor actually, in, in order to try to close that gap, uh, did reduce the amount of, of regional school transportation by a million dollars. So to suggest that it haven't, hasn't hit cities and towns I think would be a misrepresentation and we wouldn't do that. So understand that we've already had to take a million dollars out of account that's very important to cities and towns, particularly these cities and towns in the Triton District. And in addition to that, the uh, special education circuit breaker that funds those students that reach a, a high threshold, and I won't go into the details, um, that was reduced by $11.5 million. So again, it isn't that cities and towns haven't been affected. And so we start in the current fiscal year with a gap that we had to close of about $540 million. And the governor then proposes, uh, at the end, when it's fully amortized, almost $2 billion in tax increases. Now, the difficulty with that 
is that the $2 billion in tax increases in his proposal is accompanied by about $2 billion in new spending. And so you have to ask yourself the question, if we've got a problem here that we can't address, why are we embarking on a new tax and spend program for yeah. things that we don't currently have? And Brad is right. Some of these things upset me a lot. I think that we have not put the kind of investment that we need to into existing commuter rail infrastructure. I think our rolling stock is falling behind. You can point to station improvements that need mm -hmm. to be done, and yet the governor's proposing incredible new rail expansions, which, if we could pay for them, would be a wonderful idea, but not when we can't meet the commitments that we've already made. So I have a big, -ish, big, big problem with that, just speaking personally. But in addition to that, when Brad talks about the population, I think we all know we just went through a redistricting exercise because we lost another congressman. And by most accounts, if we went to this personal income tax rate that's being proposed, we would be at either the highest or among the highest rates for personal income tax in the country. And to your analogy, Mr. Chairman, about which state do you want to be drafted to, I think if folks are thinking about where they want to live, that's not one of the attributes they're looking for, is to have a very high personal income tax rate. Now, I'll grant you that the reduction in the sales tax rate for us in this part of the state looks attractive because we know we lose business across the border, but not at the price of an incredible expansion. Now, Brad mentioned some of the issues relative toward the, the exemptions that are being taken away, things like for college tuition or child care attendant to being able to work or dependents under 12. And one analysis uh, that we had seen indicated that if you took a single parent with two kids under 12, her effective tax rate under this proposal would go from 5.4 to 6.6 percent. Wow. Those are the kind of people we're trying to help. We yeah. shouldn't be doing this. And so the, the big the, the couple of problems. One, even with two billion dollars increase in taxes, look at the numbers for how much your Chapter 78 goes up. $70,000. Yeah. Yeah. So people in Raleigh would be paying an incredibly high personal income tax rate, their share of $2 billion of new taxes for $70,000 in Chapter 70 money. Um, I have a problem with that, and I think a lot of our colleagues do as well. So I think that it, it is important that we, we try to address these things, and we will. But again, just as with the housing proposal, the governor's proposal is just that. It's a budget proposal. It's meant as a guideline. The House and the Senate will have different budget proposals that are being worked on now. The uh, House will do theirs in April, we'll do ours in May, and we've got a long way to go. One of the problems is the context that we find ourselves in. Last spring, if you look April, May, June, that time frame, unemployment in Massachusetts had fallen to 6.0%. It's now gone back up to 6.7%. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty is in the middle of an uncertain economic recovery, do you want to begin increasing taxes by $2 billion, number one. Number two, you also have to think about the buying power of the situation. If we want economic growth, you have to think about who's better to create it. Is it the private sector spending those $2 billion, or is it state government bringing those $2 billion onto Beacon Hill, and with all the bureaucracy and all the cost attendant to the bureaucracy, trying to push those back out to create economic growth? I think Brad and I would both argue that there's a role here for the private sector as well that isn't being accounted for. And if we take all this money out of the private sector, even though the post-Keynesian economists among us would suggest it's wonderful for the government to spend it, the question is, it, does it have the same bang for the buck as if we let people keep it in the first place and maybe give some incentives to spend it? So a couple things. One, the level of spending that accompanies this tax increase proposal is very concerning. Number two, its effect on our economic recovery is very concerning. Number three, the fact that even after all this taxing and spending, we would still have a budget problem that would be reflected in things like local aid. And number four, the fact that there are some very important deductions that are currently available to people for very specific and real reasons. People who have kids under 12 need our help. People who are trying to go mm -hmm. to college need our help with the tuition. Taking all that into consideration, this is a very hard proposal, I think, for people to accept on either side of the aisle. 
So we'll work through this, and again, we'll get you more information as the time draws more near, and we'll provide you with more. And I think Brad's right. I think that you pretty much will be able to use the House local aid numbers as a floor. I would not use the governor's numbers as a floor. And a lot of it will depend on where the economy is headed at that point. It, the conventional wisdom is always that in an economy that's growing, the governor's numbers are the lowest, the House is a little bit more, and the Senate is a little bit more than that. And that's not just because the Senate, you know, we're generous people. We are. Um, but it's also because we have more months of information to spend more money responsibly in a growing economy. In <coughs> a down economy, it goes the other way. But I think you'd be safe to assume that the House numbers will be the floor. We'll obviously try to improve on that. But a lot of it will depend on what's happening in the economy by the time we get to that point. You know, the discussion the last week or so about gas prices going to $4 a gallon. The impact of that cost of energy will have an economic effect. The same could be true for home heating oil. A number of factors mm -hmm. here that w we simply can't control or predict right now, except to say that the House will set the floor and we'll try to do better. With, with the um, state in income tax going up to 6.3 percent, have there any estimates how much additional, say, a couple making $120,000 a year, what they would pay? Did, is there anything? There's a, there's a chart that I've seen that we don't have with us tonight okay. that, that kind of looks at people at, at different um, uh, part points on the, the spectrum. Okay. Um, but it, it would, I guess the surprising one to me, and the reason I use the example, was someone who you would think would benefit from the changes who doesn't. And, and that's concerning. The other thing is there's one estimate out there that this proposal could have the effect of uh, suppressing the creation of 91,000 new jobs. So those people wouldn't be paying anything right. at all because right. they wouldn't be employed. I'm just thinking, you know, you have, you know, right off the bat, about $1,700 taking out on that couple from the Fed, federal, then from the state, I don't know, probably be about what, $600? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking some real money out of people's pockets, and then we haven't got to the local level. I mean, you could be talking, you know, $2,500 out of, I mean, that has a significant impact on the economy. I mean, where are people, you know, they're going to make cuts. Where are they going to make those cuts? What they buy, what they purchase, where they go, their vacations. I mean, it has a ripple effect within the economy. Sure. What's, what's very frustrating to us is for the last six or seven years, we've been in this downturn. And Massachusetts actually has done a pretty good job, the, the Senate leadership, the House leadership, working together, and, and we have worked together on both sides of the aisle, to try and do the right thing to get us out of this bad economy. We didn't tax and spend ourselves out of it like other states did. Mm -hmm. We didn't borrow our way out of it like other states did. And in fact, we got our bond rating for borrowing increased to one of the best in the nation. Mm -hmm. And it's because we didn't do all of this, and yet now here we are proposing to do exactly what we were being awarded for not doing. It's very frustrating to well, us. We don't want to be Illinois, and we don't want to be California. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. And I mean, those, those two states are in shambles. But the bottom line is for us being here tonight, red flag, level fund from last year, Obviously, we're going to work to try and increase those numbers for you. Okay. But absent a lot of increase, I would argue to you that we're probably going to see pretty close to level funding for uh, municipal aid. Right. Right. Yeah, you were talking about the uh, gas tax. Went up, AAA just uh, reported it was up 14 cents in one week. And your revenues are just down tremendously because of your unemployment, unemployment going up. In one and, week. Uh, Part uh, of the, uh, the governor's <coughs> proposal is to index the gas tax to inflation so it would go up on autopilot right. um, mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. any action. And on we are close to the border here. Yeah. I mean, you got a lot of people saying, I've heard them say they go over to New Hampshire to, to they're fill they're up. They're doing it now. Absolutely, yep. they do. Yeah. So, so. And that's just, you know, safe, siphoning off money from, from the state over here. But you can't blame them because they're trying to make. The best decisions, but, yeah. But that's the economic reality, Mr. Chairman, that we have to take into account. We can't ignore it, mm -hmm. that folks are still struggling. You know, we, we, we are not out of the woods. Unemployment is creeping back up. We had to revise the budget by $540 million. So it makes you question the wisdom of this kind of an expansion of state spending. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Exactly. I mean, you can't do none it. of us run a house like this. If we did, we'd be bankrupt. With all that said, um, there's still a long process in front of us. We will keep you updated. I've been already a pain in your bum, I'm sorry to say. Um, I'm in here all the time trying mm -hmm. to give you as much information as we mm -hmm. possibly can. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll continue to do that mm -hmm. right through the end of the budget process, which will end probably June 30th. Um, and any questions that you have mm -hmm. or the board have, please don't hesitate to call our offices. Mm -hmm. uh, we work very well together and, and we'll continue to do so on your behalf. I want, I want to thank Representative Hill now that you come on board. And you, you, you've been in touch with us. You're here all the time, well, and, you're, you. and you give us a call, and you let us know, always gives a heads up what's going on. And, and Senator Dattar, um, I'm always talking to you, it seems, so <laughs> thank you so much for what, what you do for us. The only thing I'll close in is we did receive your letter um, regarding the traffic lights mm -hmm. yes. on Central okay. Street uh, and Route 1. And what we'll do is we'll get together with you okay. and see if we can get a meeting with Mass mm -hmm. Highway for them to come down and tour the the intersection oh, great. and see what uh, funds may be available to help you in that endeavor. Okay, that'd be great. And, and that's out of Arlington, right? Uh, yes, district, yes, District 4. District 4. Yeah. I used to deal with them. That's yeah. Yeah. And, and again, an issue that we've been dealing with for quite some time, and it's yes. not, uh, the urgency of it has not diminished. Um, yeah. So we need to continue to, to work on it. And we did get a little further up in Newbury at Hanover Street. We're successful in keeping some of yes. those temporary lights, so that yeah. <laughs> offers us some hope that we will be able to do it here. For, for my um, being, if you could get me some information. Yeah, sure, I have a file um, on this. On accidents that have mm -hmm. happened there and things mm -hmm. of that sort, your concerns. Um, we tend to do better if we have data to back it all up. Okay. Yep. So that would be helpful. We can do that. Thank you for your help. We appreciate it. And, and I would just echo that, uh, you know, we've always had a good relationship. I enjoy uh, working with the board. I think it's very productive. Debbie knows where to find us any time, day or night. And when she can't find me, she can find AJ. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Representative Hill is, uh, I think you'll find a very, very responsive and effective legislator. And we're lucky to have him join the delegation. So, uh, you know, we work as a team and we're happy to, to work with you on an ongoing basis. Appreciate you coming in tonight, and I know you're, you know, you have and a very you busy day, in late. both of you. <laughs> God bless you. And, and you. And you start very early in the morning. Uh, we did this morning, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> you know, we turn into Fox 25, and we, we can see you <laughs> early in the morning there. And, mm -hmm. and so, okay, any questions from the board? Yeah. Just keep the good work up. Well, yes. thank you so much for coming in. and Thank, thank, you. thank you for having us. Okay. Thank you all very much. Appreciate you coming in, Brad. Thank you. You're very again. welcome. Brad. Good to see yeah. you. All right. Thanks for your support. It's good to see you. Okay. Thank you again, Good to see you. My pleasure. That was fun. Okay. And she's, you met her before. Who? Ipswich Rotary Interact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Brad. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, she just got there uh, a week ago. Okay. So if you would. Absolutely. Okay. Thank Absolutely. you, Bruce. Thank you. Okay. I hope we didn't bore you all too much. With no, no. That was <laughs> great. No, thank you so much. That was really good tonight. Pleasure. You're always good. Well, you know thank you. Good. good to see you. Take care. Have a great night. See you you too. Good night, Bruce. Good night. Drive careful. Okay. <clears throat> That was very informative. Yes. No, it was very good. Yeah. They've been a long day. They work good as a team, them two gentlemen. They do. They, they, they do. Days. Oh, you're not kidding. They're I mean, really they really mean they want to help the community out. Oh, you, you follow them around. You follow them around. I mean, they're just exhausting, especially the both of them. I mean, it's just, hmm. we're very lucky to have them. Jay and I saw it Saturday evening. Coming over there on a Saturday evening over the blue and gold. Yep. That was awesome. Yeah. They had certificates for each other. <coughs> From uh, the Senate and the House for each of the eleven scouts that yeah, crossed over. Those <coughs> good guys. It's a, you, know, you, you have, have, like you have to be a very special the person to be a, a green suppers, yeah. washing the dishes. Yep, yep. really yeah. helps. To, to be, a, to be a, a state rep or a, a, yeah. or a uh, senator, you have to be a very special person because of the time, the commitment you have to put in. And we're very lucky. We have two people that you know they're yeah. dedicated. They're dedicated yeah. to us, so that's good. Okay, now moving on. Announcements. Raleigh Food Pantry is in need of donations. Raleigh Food Pantry is open Tuesdays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., Thursdays from 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Again, as Stu said tonight, the food is going in and is going right off the shelves. 
um, we th they have a great need within the community if you could please you know um, make a donation to the food pantry also at the library there's a basket you can drop off your your uh, dry good items and I mean they not just need particular item they need everything so again if I could add to that the uh, scouts have put uh, bags on the mailboxes oh yes uh, to for their collection of to help the uh, Raleigh food pantry and they will be collecting them Saturday morning uh, before 10 a.m. so right. we urge uh, yeah. everybody to do what they can and the scouts will come by and pick up the bags uh, of uh, any donations that you can make to they the put a red Raleigh bag, food pantry. A red plastic bag out, and there's a little. You'll see it. There's a little sticker. I found it to, uh, today on my on my mailbox. A little sticker saying at night um, on February 9th, um, about right. 10 o'clock, to have that bag. You know, any dry goods you have, put it out there, and the scouts will collect them. And you know, God bless them. They're a great, great organization too to do what they do. So. Um, Town has the following vacant seats, Planning Board full member, uh, Planning Board associate member, and Zoning Board of Appeals, three seats. Uh, again, the battery recycling box is located in the town hall right, right out here, little box. Any batteries, A, double A's, D's, anything you have that you've used and don't, instead of throwing them away, it's a good way of going green and an easy way of going green. So drop it right off here, uh, either at the, um, at the annex over at the library or right here uh, across from the um, whose office? Uh, <laughs> town clerk. Town clerk. I have talked a lot tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm, running out of I'm running out of words tonight. Okay. If I can uh, jump in. Oh, that's yours. Go ahead. Take it away. I'm Thank running you. out of words. <laughs> I have uh, been in touch with the uh, friends of the uh, Raleigh Public Library and have offered my uh, uh, assistance and they have accepted that I will be at the door at uh, the uh, Governor's Academy in Byfield for the Friends of the Raleigh Public Library 11th Annual Some Like It Hot Chili Cook-Off on Saturday, March 9th and from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And uh, you can have, come and have a great time. There will be entertainment, and uh, you'll have some great chili. And uh, it's a very, very good time, and it helps the uh, friends to help the uh, public library. And they're very, very supportive of the uh, public library. And yeah, it is a good time. It is. Cook -off. Really and, a great uh, time. If you love chili, great place to be that night. And with that, I have nothing else, so I have a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs>